Uh, Professor Hamid Dabashi, um, many thanks for taking the time to My speak pleasure. with us today on, on the question of Orientalism. Um, it's been almost 40 years ago now that uh, Edouard Said published this uh, central um, and paradigm shifting uh, work. Um, oftentimes we speak of works that change our ways of understanding uh, knowledge or regions. Um, and it seems that this has really made a mark in many ways, not only in the region of the Middle East and uh, more generally the Islamic world, but it has really very much influenced um, post-colonial studies more largely sure. in other sure. places. Sure. Um, sure. So why was, what can we take fundamentally in terms of the importance historically of the work that Said produced uh, at the time? I think you mentioned the key word is epistemic shifting. Up until the publication of uh, Edward Said's Orientalism, we didn't know how do we know what we know. What he uh, managed to do, he made us conscious of the instrumentality of this, for example, camera that uh, what your audience, your students will later see mm -hmm. from our conversation is through that camera. So what Edward Said did was made us conscious of the instrumentality of modes of knowledge production and interest in knowledge production. As you know, there were people before Edward Said who, right. like Anwar Abdul Malik, okay. like Talal Asad, four years mm -hmm. before uh, publication of Orientalism, he wrote a fantastic essay, edited volume, uh, Anthropology and the Colonial Encounter, and more or less, you know, he says the same th thing. But Edward did it with such literary panache. Right and power and authority. And also remember historically, is happens between 67 and 73. Mm -hmm. And he says in an interview that this is the environment that in which he wrote. Uh, Why is that important? Because he says in an interview, Edward Said says in an interview, that he noticed as a, prof as a young professor at Columbia University how the perception began to change between 67 and 73 of Arabs and uh, fight with uh, Israel and so forth. And he became fascinated with this conception of perception, which defines the nature of Orientalism that he did. Mm -hmm. You know, Edward was not a historian. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a literary theorist, mm -hmm. uh, a, a genius literary theorist, a monumental figure in literary theory. So the book Orientalism is from a perspective of literary mimesis, of representation who gets to represent whom and by what authority and how that representation changes. Back in the 50s, uh, Raymond Schwab had written a book on Orientalism, uh, uh, La Renaissance Orientale. But none of them had the impact of uh, Edward Said's. Again, partially because by then Foucault had become known mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Edward's notion of Orientalism heavily borrows from Foucault's uh, relation of knowledge and uh, power. So there are many reasons that locates Edward Said's Orientalism back in 78 uh, when it was published that resonated with a generation of young scholars. Now, I'm not one of those scholars because I, when I read Orientalism in graduate school at Penn, I had already read, I was deep into sociology of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So Max Scheler tells you there is a me before an I. Right. So the thing that there is a correspondence between colonialism and knowledge production was not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what became a big deal for a generation slightly younger than me, when they began to realize that there is something to trouble with the manner of knowledge right. production, right. that there is power involved yes. in the modes of knowledge production, there is a process of canonization, mm -hmm. who gets to choose what is canon. So from the epistemology of knowledge to the idiomaticity of knowledge being produced to the institutions that produce knowledge became an issue and as a result right. became the reasons right. for its uh, success. But another reason is that Edward Said's Orientalism enables you, as all great works of uh, scholarship and theory do, to disagree with him. Mm -hmm. When a book mm -hmm. is able to do that, that mm -hmm. book has guarantees mm -hmm. its... Uh, now, indeed it does, yeah. and I think it's precisely its richness that it offers this possibility to re think, reflect, disagree, and, and, and work with as an intellectual exactly. tool. Exactly. Now, we tend to forget this a little bit today because it has been so successful in yeah. helping us shift our yeah. ways of thinking. But at the time, 
the reaction to it in some sectors was quite violent. Reading again now some of the correspondence in the New York Review of Books with uh, Bernard Lewis and many others, um, one can see also that this resistance, and I think this is literally the term that one should apply, intellectual resistance or, or power, politics resistance, uh, has stayed with us as well. What is the reason for that? First of all, uh, up until recently, the same sources and institutions of knowledge production that continue to produce knowledge and establish it as truth, they haven't ceased, they have metamorphosed. And as a result, the term Orientalism and Orientalist knowledge production has become a catchword for you to point to a relation between knowledge and power. So who finances what, for what reasons? Uh, some of those exchanges, in fact, with Bernard Lewis uh, that followed Orientalism, in my opinion, were counterproductive mm -hmm. for our understanding of Orientalism. Orientalism is basically a critique of epistemology. Mm -hmm. It's a critique of knowledge mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. In Edwards' exchanges with Bernard Lewis, this became enmeshed with the Arab-Israeli yes. uh, yes. conflict. And uh, Edward, as you know, was a very passionate yes. defender of, of, of Palestinian cause, and rightly so, the, the most significant mm -hmm. spokesman mm -hmm. of the Palestinian cause abroad. And uh, as a result, it did some, in my opinion, enduring damage mm. for us to deal with. Mm. In Orientalism, Edward Said doesn't say Orientalists are evil people. Yes, yes, of course. It's a critique of yes. the mode of knowledge yes. production. So we have to, in a way, yes. bypass yes. and bracket aside, you know, yeah. Given our own politics on, on Palestine, we become enmeshed mm -hmm. in that debate mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. We have to bracket it. We put it's it a aside. Issue. It's a side issue yes. with which we have you know, our position. But go back to Orientalism. Look at the critique of uh, uh, knowledge production and do what Edward Said didn't do, mm -hmm. namely historicize it. Right. Because Edward Said right. was not a historian. Right. Go to period. In one sentence, Edward Said says, Aeschylus is Persian, mm -hmm. Dante's yes. Divine Comedy, yes. and uh, uh, something contemporary. Mm -hmm. Okay, he is at the moment of revelation. He right. is at the moment that he's telling us something we didn't know, so he's allowed to do all of these uh, conflation. But as next generations, mm -hmm. we need to historicize and realize that in the aftermath of Edward Said's publication of Orientalism, because Orientalism was coterminous with classical uh, colonialism yes. and modes of knowledge production. Yes. During the Cold War, we didn't have that mm -hmm. similar kind of knowledge production, because now you'd had departments of Middle Eastern and Near Eastern and Far Eastern studies, or Soviet studies, or Eastern European mm -hmm. studies, all of these departments were actually like a belt around yes. Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Area studies generally. Exactly. So mm -hmm. there is a transfusion, as I argue in my book on post-Orientalism, between Orientalism and area right. studies. Now, the same sentiments of knowledge and power exist between in the period of uh, area studies. But then the question is, what happens after the collapse of Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. Well, departments of area studies become irrelevant. Mm -hmm epistemically for power become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What emerges are these think tanks in right, Washington, right, D.C. Right. So precisely to follow that, now your own work in, in continuing not so much a tradition, but as, as I think you precisely said, uh, an intellectual invitation to think and rethink, you then come to work with this. Of course, you, you knew Saeed and you worked with him, but your own work um, as, a, as a thinker on these issues comes in the second generation yes. in which you take the concept, yes. I think, to precisely, as you said, historicize yes. it and yes. add to it. Yes. But I think it is also made even more interesting because the context itself of yes. the early 2000s and the late 90s well, gives us a bit of a neo-imperial moment, absolutely. which is work, absolutely. Uh, rather stuff for you to work that with. That, because imperialism, as you rightly said, is a living organism, mm -hmm. is not a stable. Uh, I always say when uh, the World Trade Center was attacked, World Trade Center is misnomer. World Trade has no center. Mm -hmm. is, is all over, 24-7. <laughs> because imperialism has become amorphous. First of all, imperialism has become amorphous because capital has become amorphous. Mm -hmm. 
Capital is amorphous. Imperialism is amorphous. Knowledge production is amorphous. You could have think tanks in uh, Doha, Qatar. You can have in Saudi Arabia. You can have uh, anywhere. They're part of a amorphous, decentered modes of knowledge mm -hmm. production to sustain uh, power that exists. But that power itself is not self-conscious. It's like a wild animal. Mm. It is not just like sitting in a mm. smoke-filled, uh, you know, room it's deciding. <laughs> is is uh, yeah? Is it doesn't have a form, mm. and as a result. Uh, wants to invade Afghanistan, mm -hmm. goes to a think tank and asks, okay, yes. now what is the language? What is the anthropology? How do we do that? And the advantage of think tanks is that contrary to you, you and I are accountable to an academic tradition. Mm -hmm. If we say publish something embarrassing, <laughs> our colleagues, our students, etc., they hold us accountable, mm -hmm. but not in think tanks. Mm -hmm. Fahad al mm -hmm. says, go to Iraq, invade. They will love you and... Uh, throw baklava at you and so rose it's part of this new mode of exactly right, he, right. they go yeah. i call it in my book post orientalism i call it disposable knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not a knowledge that you hold accountable i mean classical orientalism right. they were um, mm -hmm. masters much of languages rigorous. much more rigorous and and they spoke to history of Orient, but not this right. this this so my point is one should not fetishize mm -hmm. the insight of it or said one must learn from it and then unfold it as we move on, as right. imperialism changes, modes of knowledge change, agencies of knowledge production change, institutions of knowledge production change. Then you look at history. Right. Today, 2017, if you live in the United States, and as I'm sure you know, also in Europe, no longer Islam is subject of knowledge. They don't want to understand Islam. If you look at the culmination that has come to Steve Bannon, there is a kind of Christian eschatological triumphalism. Mm -hmm. They want to destroy Islam. Islam is the enemy. Mm -hmm. That is f whole different from generation that they wanted to understand Islam and they produced or a, kind of, a kind of Islam, mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. Islam that was compatible right. with colonialism. Right. But today, mm -hmm. in the age of Trump and mm -hmm. Steve Bannon, there is no right. attempt to understand Islam. Well, many thanks for this. My pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you.